Mrinalini is a, uh, a professor of English, associate professor of English at UVA, University of Virginia, where she's also the director of undergraduate studies and directs the concentration in um, modern literature and culture. So strangely for a, a, a senior woman faculty of color, she's very administratively busy. Um, <laughs> Um, she had a book come out in 2014 from Columbia University Press called In Stereotype, South Asia and the Global Literary Imaginary, where she challenges, us to, um, challenges the reader to take the, stere take the stereotype seriously as something that is both the object of considerable derision by a lot of the writers, the Anglophone writers on South Asia that she works with, um, but also an animating principle of their own intellectual formations, of the, own, the way that they constitute their own literatures, that the stereotype is one of those things which we all use to some extent. And um, she works through the rubrics of sort of the most salient crises of late modernism, overpopulation, filth, um, terrorism, various global phenomena, and she works through these, these concerns um, with, uh, in Anglophone South Asia literature. She's got another project underway on the politics of hunger. Politics of hunger? Cultural politics. Cultural politics of hunger, which just knowing a bit about your work, I can imagine how that too will probably make us ref reflect on the way hunger has a dual nature. Um, and um, on uh, Farouk Balsara, Freddie Mercury, for those of you who don't know that he was a Parsi who grew up in Zanzibar in India, and she's writing a book, co-writing a book, I believe, mm -hmm. on Freddie Mercury, who was just in, what was it, the New York Times? Yesterday, the day before, there was a big story on Freddie Mercury. So I know there's people in the audience very excited about that. The, talk, uh, the title of her talk for today is A Vigil Wasted. Notes on the Ruin Sublime. Um, she'll tell us how this links up to all the other things that she's involved with. So please help me welcome Renalini. Oh, sure yes. So is the mic on? Um, so I'm very happy, delighted, in fact, to be in Michigan. Um, and I want to thank Avin, Will uh, Gover for a really warm welcome um, earlier a few minutes ago, actually half an hour ago, when we met for the first time. Uh, and also Farina Mir uh, for the invitation to actually come out um, um, this semester. She invited me last semester. Um, what I will do is uh, say, uh, have two disclaimers quickly. Um, the first that I'm sort of an accidental South Asianist. So um, uh, this talk, uh, as you will see, will uh, be about, an, uh, about South Asia, but not quite. Um, and I am um, happy to talk about why that is. Um, in fact, I just wrote a piece uh, called No Future for South Asia. I think it might be out by now in, uh, uh, in a South Asian review. Um, uh, and then the other uh, disclaimer, well, it's not a disclaimer. It's, um, this is a piece that came out of the next book that I'm working on um, called uh, Settler Colonial Dystopias, and it isn't. Um, the Hunger Book, um, and uh, there I have a cha chapter on Afghanistan and the literary production there, um, but uh, don't deal with um, uh, the, uh, the uh, Nadim Aslam as a novelist. So this is what I didn't deal with in there um, that I'm presenting on. Um, I will read, because I'm not good at uh, simply extemporizing uh, the talk. Um, so. I apologize if it gets monotonous, um, but um, all right. Um, Nadim Aslam's The Wasted Vigil, a novel about the internecine conflicts in Afghanistan, opens multiply, piling wreckage after wreckage to constellate Afghanistan's many conditions of ruin. It is as if the novel assumes the place of the angel of history propelled forward by the turbulence of a storm, even as it is fixated on catastrophes of the past. The first relic of the past in the novel is a photographic frontispiece of a stone Buddha head now housed in London's Victoria and Albert Museum. 
this acrostic inclusion, itself a layering of mimetic forms, anticipates the subsequent discovery and excavation of an immense Buddha statue. The statue is interred deep below ground of a now de derelict perfumery once run by Marcus, the aging British doctor described as a prophet in wreckage. Marcus lives in the small village of Usha near Jalalabad, Afghanistan. And soon after the digging work began, they had encountered a large boulder, an indentation at the top of the mass, um, the first thing to come into view, continuing downward and around the mass, they understood that they were excavating the head of a great Buddha, a face from another time. The year is 2001, when in the shadows of the Torah Bora, the Buddha emerges as a composite sign of ruin. It is at once a remnant of a picturesque antiquity and a reminder of present corrosions, most overtly of the uh, destruction of the Bamiyan Buddha. A pathos-laden emblem of Af Afghanistan's more tranquil Buddhist past, the ravaged artifact also coalesces the violent history of cultural desecration that has gripped this nation in modern times. One that recalls not only Afghanistan's sacred antiquity while divulging it, uh, divulging the Taliban's despoliation, but ensures that the rubble in Bamiyan is counterpoised to the sculpture in the, in the London uh, <coughs> Museum. Speaking of the Buddha, Nadim Aslam says, this was my comment on the events in the Bamiyan Valley. I was saying, here the Buddha survives in the imagination of this writer, this person. What Aslam points out is a peculiar fictive joint uh, between history and its myriad returns that the classics, uh, classical relics appearance in his novel allows. The Buddha as metaphor discovered within Aslam's novel opens various different correspondences between figure and ground, narrative setting, and history. We are cautioned from the onset that no pathway is readily found, for even as this symbol invites readerly inspection of this face from another time, it realizes the hard digging work, the downward journey that is the provenance of such discovery, both archaeological and interpretive. If ruins are capacious ciphers where fantasies and ideations of a lost past jostle with the materialist experiences and effects of the present, the figurative ruin circumscribed within fiction, I want to suggest is especially so. Empire literature that takes syncretic colonial histories for its setting is uniquely yoked to ruination, seeing in its figurative plays a peculiarly apt design for eruptions and erasures of colonization. Fictions of colonial ruins enthrall and instruct by grafting the past in the present, by evoking the desolate and abandoned horizon of a distant past, whose prototype is the classical ruin, onto an inhabited but dilapidated present. These fictions animate what we may call the ruin sublime. So I want to uh, pause here for a moment and offer a few signposts um, for what follows. Um, in this talk, I attempt mainly three things. Um, the first is I offer um, reading of the novel, uh, sensitive uh, to description and setting. So here the problem of reading ruins as setting is ultimately about contemplating um, the terms of realism. Um, are fictional ruins real? Uh, how well do they tether us to particular histories of places? Um, does their fictional status endow them with a particular surreal qualities? Are contemporary colonial ruins more real than classical ones by virtue of their temporal um, or experiential uh, proximity? Second, um, I want to sort of flesh out a uh, theory of the ruin sublime, and this is the new stuff, um, and I'm uh, happy to sort of get feedback on this through a detour through uh, psychoanalysis, um, brief detour. Uh, and finally, in the third section, I want to uh, think a little bit about how other artists, um, other than novelists, are using, uh, well, one other artist, because, but there, uh, there are other examples, uh, using ruins in their work. Um, so, alongside the excavated Buddha head, the wasted vigil begins as well in another scene. This one set in an old ruined but inhabited um, house, once resplendent resplendent with colorful romantic frescoes dedicated to the five senses, it is now damaged by war. Um, 
the far-flung life stories of each of the novel's characters from Britain, Russia, the US, and Afghanistan converge here. For people who read the book, a lot of the action happens around this house. Um, the most startling feature of the ruin, it's a kind of reminiscent of an Anselm Kiefer um, uh, painting, is its impaled library with books hanging from the ceiling. On the wide ceiling are hundreds of books, each held in place by an iron nail hammered through it, a spike driven through the pages of history, a spike through the pages of love, a spike through the sacred, occasionally one of them falls by itself in an interior because it has weakened. Such descriptions transform how we grasp the ruin. On the one hand, the ceiling with books dangling overhead is an overwrought metaphor for the precarity with which history is preserved and lost in the ruin. Yet in this instance, the ruin is also called forth as a text. Albeit inverted and secreted away, the withering ceiling of books nevertheless invites and even thwarts readers as it does Lara, the Russian, and the insurgent Kasa, both of whom gaze and attempt to read these books with holes. When enough light began to enter the house, Lara, we are told, placed the mirrors on the floors to look at the books overhead, though not all of them had been nailed with the titles facing out and any number were in languages she did not possess. Further, we learn that Marcus had built up this collection over the decades and it contained the known and unknown masterpieces in several languages. The ruin in such moments is a cipher waiting decipherment. The books may be read, but they remain opaque to those who do not possess the languages necessary for reading them. Um, this deranged library is about the temptation to read and the partiality of me meaning making that accompanies uh, ruins. So many other people have um, uh, written about ruins. Um, and there's a whole, you could say, burgeoning field uh, of studies called ruin, uh, we might loosely call ruin studies. Most of them are uh, in political geography or architecture, um, even um, so a uh, few example in, examples are, uh, you know, uh, Friedrich Radzel in the 19th century is a political geographer who writes about Ruinlander and thinks about the uh, kind of a global violent conflicts and what they do to the landscape um, that is inhabited. Um, Dylan Trigg and Rose uh, McCauley have written on the aesthetics of decay and the kind of ruin lust they inspire in people who come to see uh, as tourists ruins. Um, Rose McCauley has written about ruins as the return of human creation to its state of, a state of nature. Um, Thomas Mc Farland is this um, guy who has um, uh, looked at um, the, uh, what he calls fragments um, of poetry in romantic poets and a lot about romantic poets and their uh, sort of allusions to ruins to um, uh, counter the unity of form, uh, for example, in that poetry. Um, because we're in Michigan, Tim Endesor, Endesor has written off um, the industrial ruin right in Detroit and the kind of ruin kitsch that, uh, almost an industry of the ruin kitsch that it has inspired all the coffee table books about factories or whatever um, and warehouses and uh, weddings happening in them. Um, anyway, uh, today, so I'm not going to rehearse that any more than that, um, but I'm happy to talk about the relationship of what I'm saying here today to that stuff. Um, today I explore just how the appearance of ruins in contemporary fiction reminds readers or in Julia Hill and Andreas Schonles, um, they have a big collection on um, the architects, um, on um, uh, ruination, uh, what they um, uh, call, how they uh, say uh, that ruins jolt us into kind of a wakefulness and I want to think about what they do in that sense in the literature, uh, literary works. Um, my argument simply is that ruins merge with the setting in such works to produce for readers the experience of the ruin sublime. Mediated by the text, the literary ruin conjoins the pleasure and fear to encourage what Elaine Friedgood has called strong metonymic readers. In other words, the entanglements between setting and ruins within the work of art asks readers to become political interpreters of allegory. The ruin sublime refuses typical distinctions between ruins as either classical or new, monumental or quotidian, static or changing of nature or culture, apart from a coextensive with ways of life. 
Instead, ruins uh, novels such as The Wasted Vigil compel readers, in fact, a call attention to the exercise of reading to imagine the ruins variant um, presents and futures. Echoing Nadia El Hajj, Anne Stoller reminds us that the ruins are not just found, they are made. Is the ruin an object or process, Jude Helen Schonley also asks. Rather than an inert object, the ruin in novels such as Aslam's become, uh, becomes a dynamic, if errant, process that requires it be inhabited and scrutinized, scrutinized as much by characters as by readers. The war-torn house in the novel is repeatedly made and unmade. Working with an assortment of painted plaster from its walls, Lara painstakingly searches for the outline of the picture she's trying to construct. Moving backwards and forwards, she pos positions further pieces. One fragment, we are told, quote, has half a face on it, a beauty mark on one cyclamen cheek. Um, Marcus has, out of fear of the Taliban, smeared the wall, um, um, smeared with mud all the depictions of living things on the walls. So these frescoes are mudded over. Yet over time, this work of erasure also translates into an effort to disclose, to make the ruin show itself as it were. Quote, he had begun slowly to remove the swirled covering of mud. The highest room stands revealed now. He has carefully washed away the mud, even from these fragments, Lara pieces together, end quote. In such descriptions, the ruin becomes a puzzle whose design is gleaned through deliberate acts of de and reconstruction. If the ruin is fragmentary um, as a text, a degree of artifice attends to any desire to assign meaning to it on the part of either characters or readers. Of her pictures, Lara says, it is a kind of afterlife she is constructing for all those who have been obliterated from the walls. So, while the ruin is wholly phenomenological, its very materiality hinges on subjective uh, perceptions and interference. More acute still is the idea that ruins are not static, uninhabited spaces, but inhabited and lived in and through to signify webs of dominance and obliteration. In fact, more often than not, ruins in colonial scenes contain human remains. And this is true of the novel where um, a lot of bodies are discovered in ruined uh, uh, sites. Uh, Marcus himself has an amputated hand that he's living with um, in the house, etc. Um, so there are lots of other novels we can uh, also uh, talk about. It's not only Afghan, um, uh, Afghani writing um, in the present moment, but a lot of South Asian novels um, come to mind. Um, and you know, I just want to, uh, you know, uh, um, J.G. Farrell's Siege of Krishnapur is an early one, but you can think of um, um, Anuradha Roy's um, uh, book, An Atlas of Impossible Longing, where the house is drowning in the water, etc. Um, the, may, maybe the most uh, famous one, and I just want to quickly go um, to it for those who don't know the Wasted Vigil uh, at all, is um, um, uh, perhaps uh, The English Patient. Uh, the ruin in this novel is an Italian villa that in the aftermath of the Second World War is scarred by craters and rubble and has the look of a besieged fortress. A place of shelter for the novel's principal characters, the villa, exudes the idea of ruin as a dense locus for the accretion of histories that only become intelligible through the fragments of stories that emerge from it. That the villa is inhabited despite its shattered state is what augments its value as a setting, its vestigial form continually reflecting the romance and tragedies of colonial cartographic struggles. The amnesiac English patient, a man without a face, and discovered by, disfigured by burns exists on the threshold between loss and recovery, sifting dimly through recollections about his involvement in the colonial world. So it's between his um, escapades um, in Africa and then uh, or his um, afterlife of, uh, in, in Italy. His bodily and psychic deformations, together with those of the villa's other inhabitants, his nurse Hannah, the Canadian thief Caravaggio, and um, Kip, the Sikh bomb specialist become coextensive with the disarrayed structure of the villa. Here are two symptomatic scenes of many. The first explicitly connects the ruins of the Italian villa to gaps in the narrative plot. So the books for the Englishman, as he listened intently or not, had gaps of plot like sections of a road washed out by storms, as if plaster loosened by the bombing had fallen away from a mural at night. 
the villa that she and the Englishman inhabited now was much like that. Some rooms could not be entered because of the rubble. One bomb crater allowed moon and rain into the library downstairs. In another moment, the ruin is merged with landscape. The Villa San uh, Girolamo, built to protect inhabitants from the flesh of the devil, had the look of a besieged fortress, the limbs of most of the statues blown off during the first days of shelling. There seemed little demarcation between house and landscape, between damaged building and the burned remnants and shelled remnants of the earth. To Hannah, the wild gardens were like further rooms. She worked along the edges of them, always aware of unexploded mines. So Ruina's um, setting is indispensable in such descriptions for tracing the intimacy about, between people and place, even culture and nature. The crumbling villa is, near the, is the near perfect metonymic match for the insensate and faceless Englishman, a colonial vestige in near ruins himself. The descriptions of the villa mark a proximal relation between the two, but also capture the ruin's larger cultural import. The modern ruin is a palimpsest where past and present national and individual histories, indeed the conjoining of natural and cultural forces, appear layered over and in relief. The ruin encases erratic fragments of the past, but the suggestion is that contemporary ruins halt their seamless translation into coherence. Some rooms could not be entered because of the rubble. In others, murals fall just as stories falter in gaps. In the case of inhabited ruins especially, the specter of the ruin haunts because it discloses the uneasy coexistence of devastation and survival, ruinate and subjective endurance. Ondache writes, from outside the place seemed devastated, an indoor staircase disappeared in midair, its railing hanging off, they were protected by the simple fact that the villa seemed a ruin. The ruin is, in other words, a threshold space that traverses the chasm between um, reparation and danger. Inhabited ruins may not be excavated as classical ones can be. They have to be palp palpably experienced and um, reconstructed. So in this next section, I uh, want to uh, sort of elaborate on a kind of theoretical orientation for the talk um, and um, talk about the concept uh, ruin sublime. The provenance of ruin studies has typically been in the disciplines of history, archaeology, and anthropology. In these disciplines, historicist approaches primarily taking excavation, exploration, and viewing as their methods, consider ruins as abandoned and dis disintegrating sites that reveal histories of progress or regression. The ruin gaze is essentially nostalgic. It assesses unruly, broken edifices given over to wilderness as indices of past time and trauma, a vanishing point of history now surpassed and available to scrutiny. David Lloyd points out that in the Irish colonial context, ruins that are evacuated remnants of human activity dissolve back into natural forms in a landscape that is everywhere reduced to human domination and surveillance. In short, the classical ruin is frozen in a picturesque pastoral frame of the past. In the colonial scene, the classical ruin, if chiefly a sublime aesthetic object, was also a static one. Um, to, it sort of indicates um, a glorious past uh, uh, sort of moment in history. Only late, lately has this apprehension of ruins as congealed instances of past violence that inspire ruminative reflection, what has been called ruin lust amongst transient onlookers shifted. The rise of photography in the 19th century made visible the rubble of war and colonial ruination in unprecedented ways. So Svetlana Boyem um, obviously is uh, the person who has written very movingly about um, um, uh, ruination um, uh, in um, the Eastern Bloc. This together with uh, contemporary spectacles of urban ruins, such as of abandoned factories and houses, you know, um, another instance of, uh, comes to mind of Hashima Island for people who have seen um, the uh, abandoned uh, structures and um, houses um, in, uh, in, that, uh, in that space, um, has renewed present fascination with ruins, sometimes verging on the prurient, uh, but also altered scholarly regard of them. In imperial debris, 
Again, uh, Anne Stola marks the shift of considering ruins as leftovers of the past to places that remain inhabited and thriving. What I've described as the ruin sublime extends out of Stola's reframing of ruins as places where, quote, the process of decay is ongoing. We seek to ask, Stola writes, how empire's ruins contour and carve through the psychic and material space in which people live and what compounded layers of imperial debris do to them. For Stoller, ruins no longer suture the perfected past to the present. Hence, colonial pasts may abide in ruined form, but those same ruins, when palpably lived, revitalize ruination in different, perhaps even equally troubled um, ways. The ruin showcases the malleable yet durable nature of coloniality. Reading ruins is thus, Stoller says, a political project as much as an aesthetic one. It reveals how, where, and on whom violence accumulates. So novels such as The Wasted Vigil, English Patient, and many others, and I'm happy to talk about the bigger list, invite such an idea of sedimented and subjective experience of ruins that they do um, is clear. Yet the idea that ruins stimulate connections between psychic and material space is hardly original to them. Um, neither is the notion that ruins accrete time and historical fragments unique um, to them, these novels. The ruins sublime within these uh, literary works retrieve, uh, which these literary works retrieve, proceeds from how ruins have long been thought to combine subjective libidinal responses with elusive allegorical ones. It is instructive here to turn to Freud, and I don't think we'll have time, but Benjamin is the other person who has written so much about um, uh, the material kind of debris of history, to see how instrumental ruins are for shaping modern psychic and materialist discourses. Freud's use of archeological uh, metaphors to describe the work of psychoanalysis is commonly observed. Of the therapist's method, Freud, in his preface to studies on hysteria, writes, for example, quote, this procedure was one of clearing away the pathogenic psychic material layer by layer, and we like to compare it with the technique of excavating a buried city, end quote. In another essay titled The Etiology of Hysteria, in which Freud forwards his suspect sed seduction theory, he li likens psychoanalysis to excavation. The structure of the mind he maintains is akin to how explorers perceive ruins. That is, for Fra Freud, psychic proclivities are ruins awaiting inspection. Confronted, confronted with ruins, only an innervated um, explorer, Freud contains will, uh, contends, will remain an anthropologist. Simply, quote, questioning the inhabitants, perhaps semi-barbaric people who live in the vicinity. The more invigorated one will act differently, he says, boring down into the structure. He may have brought picks, shovels, and spades with him, and he may set the inhabitants at work with these implements. He may start upon the ruins, clear away the rubbish, and uncover what is buried. The discoveries are self-explanatory. The ruined walls are part of the ramparts of a palace. The numerous inscriptions may be bilingual, reveal an uh, alphabet and a language, and then, and when they have been deciphered and translated, yield undreamed of information about the events of the remote past. Sto Saxa locuntur, stones talk. Taking the analyst as archeologist, Freud at first glance problematically reproduces ideas of civilizational mastery for the expert while reversing ignorance um, reserving ignorance, even barbarity, for those others who have long been most intimately familiar with the ruins. The explorer analyst is very much a colonialist, arriving among the heathen and directing their labor so that the meaning of their own environments may become intelligible to them. Freud's model excavates the past for the present, as does all psychoanalysis, making the ruin that which obscures, yet promises timeless and anxious returns. Stone stock, and may even be bilingual, he concludes, securing the possibility for disclosure, so fundamental to psychoanalysis from the most recalcitrant of subjects. However, by ele elevating the ruin to the principal me metaphor for describing the mind, 
Freud ensures that we attend to it, both as form and repository. Like the psyche, ruins enclose traumatic secrets. Their monumental forms are mere fragments that elaborate a past, but ones that must be carefully disinterred to locate buried or hidden absences. If ruins are like the psyche, however, they're far more complex to read. Ruins reveal what is buried, but often um, they remain cryptic, especially in these novels. In Civilization and its Discontents, Freud returns once more to the metaphor of um, the explorer enthralled by ruins, this time to explain the conflicting relations between human civilizations as projections of his structural theory of mind. Two main senses of the ruins' relation to psychic life emerge in this work. One, that it surely stirs psychic activity, akin to the oceanic feeling that Freud's longtime friend and correspondent, um, the Orientalist uh, Roman Roland, says is the sacred intuition that persists even in secular persons. And second, as any no knowledgeable explorer or analyst can see, Freud says it produces a hieroglyphic awareness of how thoroughly time and space is layered. In Rome, amongst ruins, the visitor, Freud writes, realizes the palimpsestic nature of ruins, where visible ruins are restorations made atop other ruins. This insight about the compound nature of ruins is what makes it both a repository of psychic response and a structural analog for the mind. Freud writes, now, let us, by a flight of imagination, suppose Rome is not a human habitation, but a psychical entity with a similarly long and copious past. Where the Colosseum now stands, we could at the same time admire Nero's vanished golden house. On the plaza of the Pantheon of today, the original edifice erected by Agrippa, etc., etc., ending, and the observer would perhaps only have to change the direction of his glance or his position to call up the one view or the other. Freud's account is that of a simulation where one ruin unearths others. A ruin thus is never singular in that it requires depth of perception, a sublimation, or a transport through historical times and fantasy, in that it does require depth of perception, leading to things that are unimaginable and even absurd, he writes. Ruins, in other words, are sites of the unconscious. In a much later letter to his friend Arnold Jouet, Freud again grapples with the oceanic feeling Roland insists upon and the psychic work of the ruin, uh, in the psychic work of the ruin, attempting to explain, as he says, quote, a feeling of alienation which overcame him on the Acropolis in Athens in 1904, something very intimate. To explain this feeling of disturbance, he writes a longer analysis of his visit to the Acropolis titled a disturbance of memory on the Acropolis, the account, which is a retrospective attempt at self-analysis, is clarifying because in it, Freud links his own subjective disposition. He is listless and mildly depressed to his perception of the Acropolis itself. Reflecting on the suddenness of the hol holiday he embarked on with his brother, a trip marked with delays and detours, it's actually a quite fascinating read, where he's mostly grumpy the whole time. Um, um, uh, tours to uh, delays and detours to Trieste, Freud describes the doubt that plagues him when faced with the great ruin. By evidence of my senses, I am now standing on the Acropolis, this is a quote, but I cannot believe it. Freud then proceeds to decode this feeling of disbelief as a great sensory subterfuge that has persisted in his memory of that experience many years later. Seeing the Acropolis, he concludes, throws his sense perceptions into acute disarray displacing his own insecurities, the guilty feeling that he may never reach or be deserving enough to see the great ruin onto a process of derealization, he uh, calls it. I asserted that at that time I had disbelieved in the reality of the Acropolis itself. It is precisely on this effect of the displacement that leads me to think that the actual situation on the Acropolis contained an element of doubt of reality. At the time I had or might have had a momentary feeling what I see is not real. Such a feeling is known as a feeling of derealization. So standing before the Acropolis's temple of ruins, Freud experiences the ruin sublime. In this moment, his perception of reality itself is confounded by the presence of the eternal ruin. Most importantly, this feeling of derealization Freud describes 
His strong sense that he is simultaneously in and out of reality muddles notions of sense perception and time. In becoming manifest, the Acropolis disappears. It no longer remains, as it were, only a crucible of the past, stabilizing the telos of Freud's present existence in the time of modernity. Instead, the ruined sublime ensures that the ruin is now a portal whose very presence evokes confusion of time and place in which all phenomenal certain certainty is insecure. As I've been suggesting today, it is just such experiences of the ruined sublime where the authenticity of a reader's reality and perceptual certain certainties are tested that um, these novels or other aesthetic works foreground. So I'm going to skip over um, the part uh, where I um, uh, sort of go um, into uh, Benjamin, uh, the origin um, of uh, tragi uh, tragic um, drama, whatever. Uh, you know the uh, book I'm talking about, uh, German tragic drama, uh, and where he talks about ruination. And um, uh, think just of the consequences a little bit more. Freud, uh, Freud's reliance on ruins reveal just how crucial they are to the psychic and historical materialist dispensations of modernity. Ruins, as we see, are the very ground through which our psychic proclivities towards the past, where, whether it's eruptions in the present, its retrieval or excavation, or its palimpsestic nature have been thought. If in Freud's work, access to repressed trauma and the elusive probing of the analyst have been conjoined in the ruin, in Benjamin's thought, ruins are the very ground from which alternative, often violently erased histories make their appearance. It is this, the ruin's ability to conjure forgotten memories and disrupt narrative unity, as allegory does, so that a vast, a vast field of associations are kept alive as part of history that ultimately make it suited for the literary imagination. So now I want to uh, return back to the novel and consider some other um, instances of um, recent work um, on ruins. Other than the great Buddha and the hollowed out house, Aslan's novel has an abundance of ruins that invoke these attributes of the ruined sublime. Most are set in Afghanistan, but there are also elastic ties to powerful cities in the West, St. Petersburg, London, and New York, long involved in proxy war games in that country. The book provides a global tour, one might say, through salvage that at every turn also remands the reader, like Freud's explorer, to the setting. Marcus, we learn, has buried cassettes in the garden, sound fossils that he now digs up. He plays these recordings of bird sound, jazz, and classical music to be transported fleetingly to a time two decades ago before the rise of the Taliban and the coming of, of, of Americans. There is also the television set in the garden now, a half-buried machine with roots uh, um, of trees ensnarling it. There are buried photographs of the dead revealed, such as when Kasa unearths a picture of Zamin, Marcus's daughter, someone who Kasa doesn't know is his long-lost mother, and the dead buried with photographs. The picture of a woman's eye, for example, is buried uh, with, the with the corpse of a fallen insurgent and then later reclaimed and, um, by others. Um, we learn of a modern relic, uh, um, so I'll just skip over a bunch of such examples. Against such remnants are set ancient ones found near the World Trade Center Tower. Uh, workers, quote, digging the foundations of these buildings years ago had found ancient cannonballs and bombs, a ship's anchor of a design not made after 1750, one small gold-rimmed teacup made of China but, sti uh, made of China but still intact, with two birds painted on it. The, uh, end of quote. the fragile yet durable quality of these artifacts gestures to the inexhaustible layering of past and present where inexplicably both weapons and teacups survive together. Sometimes such merging of history and setting is indeed terrible as Aslam describes how in the mountains by the house at the end of 2001, Quote, American soldiers had ceremonially buried a piece of debris taken from the ruins of the World Trade Center after the two terrorists had either been slaughtered or made to flee, end quote, ending with the ominous speculation that perhaps something sacred is meant to grow from, fragment, from the fragment of the rubble. And there's a kind of transnational then element to the layering that is not often present in um, the Freudian model. Um, 
So to the extent that these myriad ruins in the wasted vigil become aesthetically symbolic of Afghanistan as setting, they do so by imagining profound leaps between symbols and allegory, things and thoughts. But in these examples, the leaps also attach to these people, those people and entities most close to the ruins. In the case of Afghanistan's emplacements, especially um, Svetlana Boyan's argument that modern ruins in particular are, quote, reminders of war and the city's recent violent past, point to the exist coexistence of different um, uh, dimensions and historical times in the city. Yet the profound contestations that remain over what these ruins signify, the memories, actions, lived and global relations they salvage are why they are urgent for our conceptions um, of the present and how we consume um, these novels um, in the Anglophone context. So um, then I want, you know, and I want to leave open this question of um, what, uh, what to do about these ruins that the right, these writers um, feel in their descriptions of, um, of um, the global south, yeah. Um, so not always a felicitous uh, thing that they do, so right. Um, so then the turn toward other arts. I just uh, think this is interesting. Two other um, illustrations show the kinds of futurities that emerge from ruins. The first are a series of video inst art installations by the Afghani emigre Lida Abdul. And she is um, someone who also went to Irvine, but. Um, has uh, got a fair bit of recognition now. Um, um, she showed at the 51st Venice uh, Biennale uh, and is uh, showing um, in, um, the, in Vienna and Netherlands and all over the place, really. The three videos um, titled White House um, in 2005, Once Upon an Awakening 2006, and In Transit 2008 are pieces that meditate on people's relationships to ruins. In the White House, Leela shows herself, the artist, oh, what is this? Okay, we, we, we didn't get that uh, quote from Freud, that's okay. Um, the three videos, uh, so in the White House, Leela shows herself, the artist, working over a ruin. The video films her whitewashing the ruins of the presidential palace in Kabul, a grandiose structure from the early 1900s, reminiscent of, she says, the Acropolis that was bombed. Um, this piece makes a direct point about art's influence on preservation, but is about both the investment of artistic labor in the transformation of the ruin from bombed Afghani palace to the ironic White House, and the perception of viewers in reading the scene as an attempt at salvage, critique, and in fact both. Um, so it's nicer to see the actual video. It goes on for a few minutes, and she's moving around this um, building, whitewashing it, but um, for in, in the interest of time. The other two um, shorts approach ruins in yet other ways. In one, a group, this is called, uh, once um, in transit, I believe, in one, a group uh, of 20 men bind themselves, no, once upon an awakening. Um, to a ruin with ropes, engaging the structure fiercely as if an octopus through a web. Another shows 60 children playing on top of an abandoned Russian warplane. While the video of men struggling with ruins focalizes our attention on ideas of struggle and labor that go into altering ruins, the image of the plane jolts differently. The innocence and playful activity of the children stands in sharp contrast to the corrosive war machine. As the children feather the inert metallic hunk, viewers are poised between taking the plane for a plane or giving in to the fantasy of its potential flight as bird. Um, and the video shows these are feathers that the kids are um, sticking or doing something to the, and they're, they're strewn all over. Um, to return to where we began, what transfer, uh, transpires with the Buddha statue in the wasted vigil is similar to the conundrums Abdul reproduces in her work. In a surreal moment, the Buddha that is and is not Bamiyan responds to its own desecration. When, the, when Taliban infiltrators shoot at the statue, the wounded stone face, Aslam writes, secretes gold. Quote, welling up in the stone wounds, the gold eventually poured out and began to slide down the features, very slowly stripping the face. Literally again, stone stalking, yeah. 
In this moment, one at a time, uh, a one at which the sacred or redemptive quality of the ruin is most heightened, it seems as if the ruin itself is sentient or alive. The ruin becomes pure sign, inhering an absolute aesthetic or sacral dimension beyond history. Yet this fabulous animation of the Buddha is quickly surpassed by another human animation toward the relic. Kasa, the deeply confused runaway fighter, climbs the statue in an intimate embrace. Quote, Kasa is climbing the giant face, using his hands and his toes, the arc of the lip, the nose ledge reaching the top, he sits beside the horizontal ear. Now, the ruin is very much part of the repertoire of lived um, humanity. The last image we have of the Buddha is of its excavation by Western powers. The Buddha's head slowly rises off the floor in the perfume factory, the first movement it has known for several centuries. The Buddha is lowered in the grassy field uh, beside the museum, the building now secured by the British Army. There are three tons of Afghan antiquities in a warehouse near Heathrow that were illegally removed from Afghanistan at the behest of various warlords and chieftains. So the Buddha that is and is not Bamiyan is and is not the one in the frontispiece from the Victoria and Albert Museum is both stolen and rescued. The variances in how it is represented as sacred in profane embrace or as preserved museum object indicates its splintered futures. The attainment of each future depends on how readers understand the ruins embedded and global present in the history of its setting. Incidentally, all the Afghani players in the novel are killed and hence the vigil that is wasted. So that is all, thank you very much. And I'm happy to um, sort of try to answer any, um, there yeah. must be a lot. I know Freud is not a good example to bring <laughs> to any POCO talk. Thank you, that was beautiful and elegant and really nice. I enjoyed that a lot. And so I, I'm just gonna let you field questions. Sure. But I will ask uh, those of you who are willing to speak into the mic, otherwise someone who wants to watch this in a future session won't be able to hear the question. This is being filmed. Thank you for your talk. I didn't really want to be the one to begin, but <laughs> since there was a silence, I thought I'd just leap right in. I think for this question, I'm going to request that you return to the slide of the library. Okay, let me see. That one, right. yes. So I'm interested in the way the past is figured in, in both in a sense of discipline that you brought up, you know, archeology span and the others but also in the thinkers that you raised. So at least in the first image you had of Benjamin's uh, Angelus Novus, my sense of the past there is one of trauma uh, and the historical materialist, you know, exploring that trauma and perhaps retrieving, you know, something positive out of it perhaps. But really the dominant image is that of trauma. Uh, I was really interested in the Freudian reading where it seems that Ruin is not, is not something that's dead and gone. It's animated. It's very productive, you know. But, and then when you talked about Stola and how the ruin doesn't suture the past and the present for her, I want, to, I want you to, you know, explain to me what the relationship might be between the suturing versus what you have here, the spike, uh, driven through the pages of history. A spike, I mean, there's such a sense of killing the vampire there. Um, so I'm just curious about, you know, this, this entire kind of dynamic between what's dead and what's being enlivened, and in, in, in what metaphors, you know, you're, you're actually moving through it. Yeah, so that's a, a very lovely question. <laughs> uh, 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 lovely because it's so, um, um, you know, difficult to answer in a way. Um, uh, I think what I will um, say for the moment is that there is a kind of um, tension between, um, that is not necessarily about a dissimilar tension between how um, Benjamin characterizes um, the angel of history and the predicament of the angel um, of history as 
uh, she stands and um, is moved uh, toward a future, um, you know, uh, and compelled at the same time to look back on the catastrophic um, ground that is there, right? And the suggestion there is always in this sense a kind of remainder of the trauma of the past that carries over um, uh, into any future that uh, uh, that that um, uh, that histor historical uh, narrative um, forecasts or as the end point. Um, in the Freud, I um, I think there is a similar kind of um, tension where the uh, a uh, metaphor of the ma the structural kind of topology, right, um, of uh, of um, um, psychoanalysis that takes um, excavation as its central a central metaphor is always towards a kind of resolution of the trauma, so that you uncover uh, that which cannot be easily disclosed, and in so uncovering it, um, resolve um, uh, something that haunts um, haunts. Um, or is a symptom, right, um, of, uh, of a problem. Um, so the, 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 those are similar problems in some way, um, but uh, in the Freudian uh, model, I think, um, so I, I don't know how to work out that tension. I think those tensions are present in, in um, aesthetic, aesthetic works, right, uh, where there is a certain kind of libidinal uh, quality to including ruins in uh, works that works that work in uh, especially in the Islam or books that um, try to map a ruin in various different scenes and locations that work uh, analogously to the Freudian uh, kind of uh, layered uh, model uh, and that experience. But at the same time, it is also about uh, the kind of history of a past um, that uh, has, is being elaborated in narrative um, uh, form through setting. So I don't think I'm answering your question, but I don't think they're, diff uh, they're, they're not um, dissimilar problems, um, what uh, Benjamin is grappling with without necessarily making it uh, the curative, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, giving it the curative shape that Freud does um, in his in his work um, I don't think I, so I don't I don't know the uh, the book with the pages um, of history yeah um, it's it's a fabulous image right um, uh, almost um, uh, when you read it in the novel it's almost uh, an impossible image you can't it seems uh, overly done um, it, it's an exaggerated uh, kind of scene where the books are all nailed to, uh, to the to the wall by this British um, uh, reader who is so uh, attached to Afghanistan without necessarily, and just realizes, realizes his own complicity in that history of violence, but cannot leave it, et cetera. Um, yeah. Um, Wait, so. Just on, on related to that, and that is, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned only the English patient, but I was thinking of Anil's ghost. And that, you know, the whole sense of archaeology and forensics coming together, I think would be really useful because there too, ruins are all over the place, you know, yeah. especially the Buddhist ruins in right, Sri Lanka. Right. And, and not only the reconstruction of the face of the Buddha, um, which is what's happening with um, the whole discourse around Bamiyan now in Afghanistan is about restoring or whether or not those um, statues can be rebuilt and who will pay for it and how to how to uh, restore and, and that's what Anil's ghost does there's a house there too where a uh, sailor's identity is reconstructed and the face is revealed etc but but yeah um, thank you so yeah thanks for that wonderful talk I have to confess I don't know this novel so my you know, my question will come kind of like off center here, but I was just curious um, about, uh, you know, the end when you talk about the the Buddhas in the museum and, you know, this kind of double-edged way in which we can read them. Um, and I was thinking of, of how you might think about the will to ruin. So in other words, not so much of thinking about ruins as vestiges of the past that we can either deal with as traumatic or redeeming or something like that, but rather ruination in the present and ruination in the future. I mean, you know, what's interesting about the whole Buddha discussion 
was the fact that this, in the West at least, is seen as a, you know, as something that the Taliban are doing, right? And that th therefore, uh, you know, needs a rescue operation. But that rescue operation, in fact, results in the desire to ruin in some ways. Like, let's bomb the hell out of them. Right. Um, so I'm just, I'm just thinking about the connections between the ruins of the past, the will to ruin, you know, in the present, both on the part of the Taliban, but also on the part of the West, uh, and the ruinations um, that are yet to come. Yeah, I think that's um, that, that, that's very much on point. But even with the Taliban, you know, the, the prominent narrative with um, the with the Bamiyan Buddhas, as with Palmyra, all these sites is about um, oh, they don't appreciate their own culture. They don't have a, um, a, a relationship to their own antiquity, and therefore, um, it's the, these are instances of fundamentalism, etc. But if you um, read carefully, even um, the exchanges around the Bamiyan Buddha, there are all these myriad ways in which, um, you know, the, I, I think it's this guy called Mo, Muhammad Omar, Mullah Omar. He was the a person who finally in 2001 ordered the uh, act that they be, but over, um, that they be blown up. But <laughs> over the years, in the long history of the Bamiyan, there have been repeated attempts to take uh, the statues down. It's not the very first, but that doesn't justify this moment. Um, at the same time, the dialogue around that, um, you know, the edict that he sort of sent out, that he has to go ahead and blow it up, um, is very, uh, very um, resonant with these questions about uh, the futurity. Um, apparently, one of one of the narratives there is that um, the Swedish, the Swedes, I think, came in and sa wanted to restore the Bamiyan the, uh, uh, before the uh, Taliban had even contemplated doing anything to it, or just as they were trying to starting to talk. And um, Mullah Omar um, apparently said that uh, no. We want to. Um, uh, we, would you give us the money for humanitarian cause? There's a famine on here, and uh, the Swedes said, "No, of course not. This is for uh, for the restoration project that we want to undertake." And um, that uh, is given as a reason, a catalyst for why um, the decision was made to blow it up. Because um, you know, um, so it's the the logics. Um, of that futurity, the way in which we might read intention in that moment has to do with the geopolitics of, of um, what's happening in Afghanistan at that point in time, right? Um, uh, the invasion of uh, the, by the Americans and uh, the kind of way in which the Taliban are, um, um, are um, jostling for power um, because this um, suddenly they find themselves unsupported by the very same people who were supporting them last year. Um, you know. So um, yeah, I, I think the, will to, uh, the, the question of time actually doesn't um, progress in the same way once you really start thinking about the ways in which um, the, the narratives are organized around, around uh, these acts of ruination, right? Um, but definitely in these books, they are tied to, um, to these kinds of concerns about um, asymmetrical global uh, power relations between these nations. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Good point, Good. thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm so taken with your idea of the um, the ruin sublime, especially given the way that the kind of industry around looking at ruins in Detroit was going when things were really bad. But I also think of the sublime as in many ways anti-allegorical because of how, at least in the Kantian sense, right? And so I'm very familiar, you invoked it as well with the kind of Benjaminian version where ruins are allegory. So I wondered if you could uh, just explain a little bit the relationship between allegory and the sublime for you. Um. Okay, so let me uh, uh, th think about this in a little bit of a um, different way. Um, perhaps um, the idea of the allegorical is very much about the way in which the historical uh, manifests itself, right? Uh, in uh, Benjamin, it's about the writing um, of a particular kind of history that is, uh, that is um, able to um, uh, use, uh, you know, so, uh, sort of always use the um, uh, remnants 
uh, that weren't part of a kind of meta narrative of history and reach uh, different kinds of um, um, uh, contrapuntal right uh, ways of thinking about a narrative uh, organization. But um, the sublime is in a sense, a little bit, um, uh, at least in the classical romantic way of thinking about the sublime, is about the idea of, um, of an awesome uh, response to something, uh, something that goes beyond subjective perception, right? That is an idea of, uh, of grandeur or beauty that cannot be reconciled to the beautiful, uh, so that it's terrible in some instance. So, I was trying to, um, perhaps with the ruined sublime, you said it's anti-allegorical. Um, yes, perhaps it is anti-allegorical. Um, I think in the novels, the, um, the uh, gesture is toward the kind of uh, production of the sublime, either in the nov in the, within the narrative of the novel or for the readers who are fascinated or fixated on the problem of Afghanistan under the circumstance of war. So it is the production of a particular kind of Kantian right, uh, uh, exception to the state of, uh, state of, um, uh, of the beautiful, for example. Right? Um, but it tells a story that is a bit different if you're thinking his, uh, of allegory as history, but the sublime as subjective. And I think that's the uh, difference I was uh, trying to parse, which is why you need um, both Freud and, and, um, and Benjamin to, uh, to take us through those two various different ways, actually, of thinking about what the text is capable of doing, um, you know. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I still have to figure out what uh, the reader response st stuff in there because uh, readers come at the work from various different ways, and um, and I think it's a bit general to say that the reader will respond in this particular way to the the ruin as a sublime kind of instance or. Um, as an in instance of a, of a gesture toward a historical um, gap, as it were. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have the answer there either. Uh, but it's a good question because I think it's it's the big problem between the subjective and the um, uh, his, historical, which is not subjective at all, actually. Questions. I, let me just uh, fill the time a minute, then while people get their other questions lo loaded in. Um, I just want to say, uh, from my little temporary perch in admin position here, that when we got when we advertised your talk <coughs> on the Center for South Asian Studies website, the Buddha head was laying down. It was like this. Mm. And then we asked the International Institute, which is a much bigger and more serious entity, if you could please put our little advertisement for this talk up on the main website. They corrected it. <laughs> they, they, put, they put their head straight up and down, you know, so it continues to levitate off the perfume floor, whatever. I also think a little bit about um, the, the, the romantic sublime and the origins of that concept in Burke and, and later in Locke. And, and um, for, for those thinkers in the Scottish Enlightenment, the, the sublime worked in, in large part because it could conjure associations, right? And there's a very different kind of association being conjured by the ruins of the Parthenon than by a ruined tobacconist shop on a bombed out street. And so I'm wondering whether the sublime is too, you know, either too tight of a concept or too large of a concept to excavate the kinds of connections you're making in your reading here. It probably is, um, I would say. Um, I think when I think of um, that moment in Freud when he's talking about the moment of derealization right before the Acropolis, that's mm -hmm. a kind of sublime that is um, produced in him 
because of his terror um, at, the, uh, at the Acropolis, whether it is because he is disturbed from having had that experience of having come there or his own feeling of inadequacy or that kind of existential leap that he has to make between his um, uh, inconsequential self and the kind of eternalness uh, of, uh, of that uh, monument. Um, that is an instance of um, a kind of um, sublime that is almost sort of Wordsworthian um, in 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 its um, accounting, right? The uh, the uh, the specter of its grandeur somehow reduces him and makes him feel even well, that's a true sublime. yeah worse worse about himself. <coughs> Um, but I don't think that is true about the tobacconist uh, shop. And I think that uh, you're right in suggesting that uh, instances of the ruin that are more, um, um, even the villa in um, uh, Michael Ondaatje's novel or uh, instances in these books that are more minor in some way, um, especially where um, that uh, experience is um, inhabited. I think it's different. Um, there's a different kind of intimacy with the ruin there um, that doesn't conjure this um, response that is subjective. Um, I have to think a little bit more about that difference, um, uh, whether that is a different feeling that Stoller describes about the debris or people living in these uh, houses that look like ruins to others but are not looking like ruins to them, right? Um, uh, and that, that's also a subjective response uh, in some way. Um, okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry, the, um, do you know Animals People? Yeah. Yeah, you know that long section where he's wandering through the, um, the Union Carbide Factory and it's almost hallucinatory? And I was wondering if that kind of, um, your talk was just so rich for me, that kind of, it's a ruin, but is it a ruin of something that was good or bad? I mean, it's clearly a kind of monstrous space. But I was also thinking about just contemporary debates around kind of Hindu-Muslim tensions, right? And the reusing of the ruin for a new place of worship or the destruction of something to, as though that's a sacred act. So I don't know if I'm being helpful. Yeah, but. no, I, that's great. I mean, I think in, uh, in terms of animals, people, the uh, end is uh, where he ends up back in the ruin, right? He ends up back in that space uh, from which he emerges then. Uh, and says he is human after all, which is the sort of the deflating moment uh, in the in the book after he has insisted on his animality all along. I haven't thought of that novel in those terms, but it's more like um, the kind of space um, um, that is not exactly the Acropolis, or in that sense, um, you know, um, it is what has made him. Uh, so in that sense, it's quite different. Um, yeah. I haven't thought of animals people in that regard. Right. Well, well, right. Exactly. So while people are still thinking about questions and, and comments, I mean, I actually was wondering whether I could could shift gears a, a little bit because um, and not so much ask you about this question. But I was very intrigued by your opening statement because I thought, you know, here's a kindred spirit when you said that you were an accidental South Asianist because that very much feel that way myself. I was trained as an Africanist. I did very little. I've done very little in South Asian studies. But of course, Will keeps inviting me. So I always I show up. Um, so I'd like to hear more about how, what you mean by and how you became an accidental South Asianist. And I'd also love to know why you think, and I'm not sure I want to join hands with you on this, not in this crowd, uh, wh why you think South Asian studies has no future. <laughs> OK, so good. Um, accidental South Asianist, what do I mean by that? It just so happened that my first book um, looked at Anglophone novels from South Asia, and I thought about the problem of these Anglophone writers from South Asia imagining uh, themselves as st in stereotypical ways um, in these novels. Um, um, I haven't, um, so I don't have, um, um, I didn't grow up in South Asia, so I don't have a intimacy there um, that people who have that kind of background uh, do so that I think I always feel a little bit uh, 
that it's learned and experienced in some ways that are different from people who have a kind of authentic, there's an authenticity gap, let's just say, um, in that sense. Um, um, about, uh, for example, about um, this talk on Afghanistan, it's not really then about Afghanistan at all, even though I have read um, the history of Afghanistan in order to write about it sensibly, right? So I know that it's a Gandhara Buddha and Buddhism flourished for thousands of years, a thousand or 1300 years before, um, before the, uh, the Mughal Empire and others, um, uh, you know, uh, were, became prominent in, in Afghanistan. So in that sense, it's a kind of a, uh, consciously learned uh, knowledge for me all the time. The second, I think the future for South Asia was a very particular debate. Uh, I was invited to be on a panel uh, in, I shouldn't say anything about that panel, but it was a very wonderful <laughs> panel at M MLA that uh, co was called the, um, what's wrong with South Asian studies or where, where is it going to die or something like this. Um, that the, <laughs> some sort of problem with South Asian studies. And um, um, there was a, a call written for that special panel um, that basically forecast um, a real crisis in the field. And I didn't feel that the field was in crisis. There's a lot of writing that is uh, coming out uh, in terms of novels, um, both uh, Anglophone but also regional literatures. They're thriving in many ways. And, and, um, that, uh, and the, one of the problems um, in that uh, way that that crisis was described was that African literatures is becoming prominent in um, the MLA and in the discipline and there are these forums that are now on African and African literatures and South Asia which started the whole kind of um, show um, Poco has has is falling out we need to do something and what are what are the solutions these new South Asian critics are going to offer um, so there I, I said um, that um, South Asia is a a kind of problematic moniker that has a history in area studies uh, that is not salutatious in, in um, salutary in in terms of um, its rise as a discipline in the U.S. You know, Michigan was one of the first. We were talking about that earlier. Um, Penn and Berkeley, uh, where a lot of political scientists and other uh, instrumental type of South Asianists um, gathered uh, after the Second World War and organized the. Discipline, it has a particular kind of divestment from aesthetic, um, uh, aesthetic study, or at least did in its origins. Um, so that was the discussion that we don't need to maybe um, be in a competitive play of preference uh, within uh, English studies for whether African uh, novels uh, or South Asian ones are more important or interesting and, and uh, whether uh, whether this uh, kind of idea of South Asia as a, uh, whether this idea of South Asia that aligns so nicely with SARC and all of these other new neoliberal kinds of organizations now uh, and is anti um, uh, the kind of um, uh, Nehru Nakuma uh, Nasser alliance uh, is the one to go with. Um, uh, you know, I remember thinking, I, I think I. Tagore had this great line in his um, essay on Vishwa Shahito, which is the world literature essay where he said, or maybe it wasn't from, anyway, the line is something like, um, I love India, but I'm not a patriot. Um, I will go the world over to find my compatriots, something like this. So kind of uh, the, the, that universalizing impetus in uh, the world literature essay, I find useful. Um, even though it's bogged down with Tagore's own kinds of um, uh, impressions of the world, which is as it should be. Yeah. So that's why, that was the discussion out of why I thought South Asia, we can let it go. It's everywhere, uh, actually. Um, you can't have the English novel without having South Asia. Uh -huh. Thank you for the talk. It, it was very dense in trying to grapple with it as I as I like pose my question. Uh, I'm a first year history PhD student, so um, so 
I was, I was actually I'm not I don't think I've understood exactly uh, how you you mentioned ruins create a strong metonymic reader and that spurs the idea that um, when when we discuss ruin not the ruin sublime as you put it but ruins um, when we discuss ruins in our own you know work often it happens that the spectator in in many parts of South Asia become immune to a ruin and it's, it produces a kind of like I would say a how Benjamin would produce, play a shock effect and, and that kind of immune spectator, which which is what leads to the politics of, um, in my mind, the example I have is the partition survivors taking refuge in, you know, ma that like, spectacular ruin such as Humayun's tomb, that kind of an effect. And on the one hand, while that has its own politics, but it also creates its own, um, you know, effect where we have the condition of, you know, Artifacts and archaeology, what is present in the South Asia today? I was just curious if that is, if ruin sublime, uh, if that, if there, are, you know, you grapple with with different notions of ruin while you also discuss ruin sublime in your work. I'm just like, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, there's a whole uh, kind of. Um, story to be told about how ruins have become exported uh, to the West. And this is the story of the Buddha that has come, uh, but also really uh, the story of a, a whole market in ruins. And um, there's somewhat, uh, something has been written uh, about uh, the kind of um, ways in which um, in Afghanistan, especially certain um, digs, the digging of antiquities is a kind of pedestrian activity um, that happens the season of opium, hashish, winter, and then the antiquities, how it's been framed many times, you know. Um, so that, and that there is a connection there uh, between the sending or, or taking out or excavating and selling of those um, antiquities and um, the economy. Uh, obviously, and the state that people find themselves in where, um, uh, so there you have that exact same uh, question of, of the uh, fact that the ruin is not um, exalted and it's not uh, given this kind of, it's just seen as a means to an end uh, to survive um, whatever is going on that's pretty drastic. Um, and I think that is a different, that is not the kind of ruin necessarily that we are seeing in these Anglophone go global novels. The novel itself sees the ruin as a hallowed, um, hallowed kind of uh, thing and uh, wants to make some kind of statement uh, with uh, readers who have never experienced um, that kind of pedestrian relationship. For example, the partition um, uh, people who come from the, uh, through the cross borders or whatever, they're not that concerned about where it is they spend the night as long as they get to survive the journey there. Um, so I think there is that, but that is not immediately what the concern is of these books. Um, uh, and this is a problem of the Anglophone novel. It's not a, um, um, I, I don't know how to say, it's not something to be celebrated necessarily, even though that it makes its uh, uh, design seem that way, you know. Um, yeah, uh, so it's, it's a problem that these novels are are um, insensitive to uh, one of those um, aspects uh, of the. Uh, Marunalini, I'll speak with great hesitation because your lecture has been quite an intellectual treat. Oh, thank you. So my thoughts are a, a layman's response. Uh, it is true that from the second half of the 17th century to the end of the 18th century in England, as you know, as uh, 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 Will was saying, this uh, debate about uh, uh, in literature uh, about the graveyard school the deserted uh, church you know say, and so on uh, to decide the question between beauty and sublime uh, 
resulting finally into Burke's formulation that sublime is you know what dazzles you can't comprehend but you have to accept it uh, while and uh, at the back of it was the conflict between the Garden of Eden and uh, Saturn's uh, entirely chaotic uh, universe, a new universe created of flowing fires. So, uh, so it was a theological uh, discussion resulting into the idea of pol uh, sublime, both as historical and political idea of sublime. Then comes the suddenly, while people in England were not ready, the formulation of idea of history as something which is logical, manageable, and history falls on them when they were not entirely ready for that. They're still grappling with the idea of how to cope with ruins. <coughs> then they find in the colonies lots of ruins with which people are very comfortable. But the British were not. The colonialists were not comfortable with the ruins. Uh, they, uh, at least in India, they still not figured out, they could not figure out through their years what to do with uh, these uh, about 150,000 ruins that day. Okay. <coughs> the, what I'm trying to say is the ease of living with ruins varies. Say in the heights of uh, Machu Picchu, uh, that poet, I think Neruda, isn't it? Mm -hmm is comfortable with those ruins. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the colonialists would not feel a, a sense, the same sense of comfort with the ruins. Uh, in Afghanistan, or in the world outside Europe, uh, ruins will have a different relationship with life and I'm saying this because in what you quoted from Freud had a tremendous sentence which attracted me about one has to be bilingual the way the past tense works in one language will not be the way the past tense works in another language even while digging up the so given that difference, is it really a political, p I understand that the, 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 that the West, Europe, they have been unfair to colonies, unfair to the South, it's a huge political thing, that, uh, it, it is there. But for how long can we go on? beating them with that stick. That's one thing. And the second, about the Babri Masjid, that question. See, now uh, ruins are acquiring suddenly in countries like Afghanistan or in India or Sri Lanka a, <coughs> a character where we have acquired the role of the colonialists. Uh, Europe does not have to do that anymore. Uh, we have been transformed into thinking about ruins in a way uh, in which we did not think about them. They were kind of continuity of life for us. In every village in India, there is some kind of well where people say, okay, Ram came here and shot an arrow and the well came up. And there's no need to ascertain the veracity of that because it because everybody knows that it's a, it's it's a, it's truth because it's a lie <coughs> i mean that's that's how it's taken for granted uh, so if uh, if the uh, of course the violence the brutality in destruction that's one thing but once that is happened, I'm not uh, ready to condone that. But when something starts existing as ruin, uh, do the Afghans 
or the Chinese or the Indians uh, feel upset about something being ruined. Uh, th this yeah, question, no, your your lecture was so superb, and to ask such a uh, stupid question, I feel very hesitant. But these are the thoughts which you evoked in my mind. Therefore, I am presenting these thoughts to you. Thank you. No, thank you very much. I I think um, this is not going to uh, this. I uh, this is not a, a, a again a way to evade. But the what I want to say, I think, is. Um, to think about the language question uh, a little bit, because I think it's tied in with this question of how Babri Masjid has come to acquire a certain kind of communal status um, in India. Uh, it's tied in <coughs> with questions of not only religion, but also linguistic kind of um, you know, um, identity. Um, and especially if you're talking about literature, I think that is important that because, you know, what is this? This is a book um, I've read that's written in English uh, by a British um, uh, Asian writer who has, been, uh, who has gone to Kabul after writing the book, um, uh, Nadim Aslam, right? Um, so, but, but the, you know, I read a very fantastic um, piece by this um, Afghani writer called uh, Faisal Haq Hashimi in which he talks about the long history of uh, poetry in Afghanistan. And he describes um, Rumi and Rabia, Balki, um, these famous Afghani writers, and the tradition of poetry um, that is alive even uh, amongst the Taliban. And he describes all the festivals that are poetry festivals, not unlike uh, the mehfils in, uh, in India still that are um, uh, you know, uh, the poetry festivals in Jalalabad and all of them that are still. But one thing that he says is that um, he writes in English and he says that that feels like uh, the most uh, distant um, uh, choice he has made to be away from this kind of intimacy with that kind of um, communal um, uh, feeling with regard to language, but a safe choice for him. Because in Afghanistan, he says, people are, I don't know how much to believe that, people are, um, are, are really torn up over the question of whether to write in Dari or Pashto and uh, whether uh, to write in Uzbek. And the question of, um, uh, and the ways in which um, language, um, uh, uh, Afghani languages are infiltrated with the language of war, so that even children are given problems um, in maths, problems in school that say, you know, there are so many infidels and so many this, and how many will you kill, and that's a math, math problem, right? So he, uh, for, from his perspective, um, it's safer to write for him in English in the sense that not that he'll be safer physically, but that he doesn't have to involve himself in having to choose um, choose and uh, the way that this goes to this other problem of the uh, the way in which certain ruins are cathected uh, communally uh, has I think to do with uh, with this um, question of um, uh, of the global south right we can the distance the novel provides uh, standing outside of the circumstance of uh, inhabiting that ruin or being close to it or being easy with it or comfortable with it uh, is um, is like this writer who has chosen to write in English because he can't decide between his brother writes in Pashto, his sister writes in Dari, and he thought of Uzbek for a while, but he can't um, commit. Uh, and he can't commit because the debates are fierce. Um, and that commitment means something in terms of how, whether you are aligning with the North or whether you're Pashtun from the South or whether you, you know, um, are uh, espousing a bilingual <laughs> uh, nurse if you write in multiple languages. Um, I, I think that's a different uh, case perhaps than what you're talking about. I'm not sure people are that easy with ruins even in South Asia, in different places. Um, they're compelled to be, uh, maybe, but not. Thank yeah. you. No, when I mentioned bilingualism, it was... From the Freud, yeah, but... Exactly. 
Yeah, the Freud. Uh, But you can't. But yeah. yeah. We are we're in a bilingual room in the sense that we want to continue this conversation and we have a whole nother group of people who are on the clock and need to clear it for the next group. So Shorjindra, I know you had a question. I hope you'll come up and, and, and talk uh, with Manalini about it while we're packing up. I want to thank everybody for coming. This is a great session and thank you especially Professor Chakravarti for a, a, a really provocative talk. Thanks. Thank you.